And what we've been talking about in this uh, little series, I hope has not appeared over simple to you. I know that many of you, <laughs> many of you have very advanced ministries and you're working in power and wisdom to the glory of God where you are. And um, so I need to just review what we've looked at and talk about what we're doing because what we're doing here is trying to show how the deep, deep truths and realities of Jesus Christ are accessible to every person. We need to reaffirm when we look at the scriptures and at Jesus Christ, it's all true. It works. It's accessible to anyone. And there's nothing on earth to compare with it. Nothing to compare with it. And we need to stand forth in the confidence that this is knowledge of reality that we have in ourselves and that we bring to others in a gentle but firm, unmovable way that comes out of our knowledge of the reality of Christ. And we concluded the last session I was speaking in with that verse in John 8, if you continue in my word, but it really means if you live in it, the word minnow, if you abide in it, then you are my students indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will liberate you into the greatness and goodness of God. And I'm hoping that we can bring this to our churches of all levels and all kinds, and that we can get past so many of the petty things that occupy our time and divide us from one another and give us um, bad reasons for not caring about one another. Because after all, they're different in kind. But once we step into the area of discipleship, we're beyond that. And discipleship is the true ecumenicity. It's, it's the way that the people of Christ really come together, not by administrative action, but by the spontaneous behavior of Christians towards one another. And it issues in a, a kind of obedience that is easy and routine because of the understanding of the reality of what we're dealing with. So basically we started out with the great verse where Jesus says, Come unto me, all you who labor. And I believe he's talking about laboring under religion. And I think the context in Matthew 11 will bear that out if you look at the context. And he's saying, come to me and accept your life with me in the kingdom of God as a little child would accept it and just begin to live it. And then we looked at the Great Commission in Matthew 28, which actually spells out how you do that. Matthew 28 is what Jesus did. Jesus made disciples, and he brought them together in Trinitarian fellowship, and he taught them to do everything that he said. Now, by the time he left, there was a lot left to do, and there was a lot of growing to take place. And that is certainly true today, where the main field for discipleship evangelism is in the church itself. And there are the people who are ready to go. And if we will gently present the gospel and reality of the kingdom of God in the context of the churches where we serve and the communities where we serve, and I realize churches can take many different forms, if we do that, then we will see disciples emerging. And we will see them coming together in a kind of unity that is Trinitarian. And then we're in a position to teach ourselves and to teach them how to do everything that he said. We occasionally need to say to ourselves, there isn't a single thing that Jesus said that we cannot do. There isn't a single thing that he said that we can do on our own, but we're not on our own. 
and everything that he said is accessible to us. And in these last uh, two main sessions, uh, tonight and in the morning, uh, we're going to be talking about the last phase of the Great Commission, teaching people to do everything that he said. And we will try to be somewhat specific here and there, but the main thing is to understand that we can do that. It has to be intentional. It won't happen if we don't intend to do it. And the sad thing today is that the bad news, the bad, the gospel of the devil, if you wish, is you can't do it. Oh no, you can. Grace is here to make it possible. Grace is God acting in our lives to accomplish what we cannot accomplish on our own. Would you put that down by, beside the standard uh, hackneyed phrase that grace is uh, undeserved favor? Because that doesn't tell you what it is. What is it? It's God acting in your life. What is God acting in your life? It's the kingdom of God. It's the reign of God in your life. And now when we come to this phase, we have to talk in very particular terms about how change actually happens. And there's one big thought that I want to make sure that I get on your plate. And that is, if you're going to be transformed, you have to transform your parts. One of the things that defeats Christian growth is failure to attend to the parts of the person. For example, in the scriptures, like in Romans 12, we have a statement, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. Now that's an activity. I'm not going to ask you to indicate if you've done that. But when I was uh, very young and Jane and I were together in college, there was a, a great man of God named Walter Wilson. He was a medical doctor. And he was the first person who ever said in my presence that we should actually do this. We should present our bodies. And we're going to try to talk about more about why that's so important tonight, because one of your body is one of the main parts of you as a person. See, you are a non-physical reality with a physical body. And that physical body is there for a great purpose. It's one of the things that differentiates you from an angel is you have a physical body and that's because God has a different kind of plan for you and for me than he has for angels. Presenting our body as a living sacrifice. But notice how this goes on. And do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Aha, another part. So if you wish to not be conformed to the world, one of the main things you have to do is transform your mind. And your mind, if it is transformed, will transform the rest of you. And that can be misleading, but what we want to understand is here we're dealing with a very complex being, a human being. And that being has essential parts and actually, they work differently in some people. And this is important to understand because when we come to the area of practical transformation, we're in the area that we also call spiritual disciplines. And spiritual disciplines are not the same for everyone. They don't work the same way. And some people need more work on their body than they do on their mind. And others need more work on their mind than they do on their body. And some need deep soul work. Your soul is another part of you, essential to a, being a person. Some are caught in a web of social relations that is simply destroying them. 
And so we need, we're going to look at the, the main parts of the person in a moment. But the idea here is very simple. Take care of the parts and the whole will take care of itself. It's very simple, very important. If you miss it, it will lead to a life of frustration. It will lead to a life of failure because you keep trying to change you without changing your parts. And you can't do it. On the other hand, because that's the way things are set up, you can change you. You look at a great passage like 1 Corinthians 13. And when most people look at that, they despair. But they can become a person possessed of love. Love suffers long and is kind. Well, most people will get off the boat at that point. <laughs> you know, they, they don't want to go on. Uh, doesn't envy. Uh, isn't puffed up and so on all the way down to believeth all things, hopeth all things, and so on, and they just sign off. And the same thing happens with the Sermon on the Mount. But that's because they are thinking wrongly about how change occurs. And in order to get this right, we have to think about the parts of the self. Now, Dr. Jesus gives us, and by the way, I'm sure he could have beat anyone at tennis. Think about it. You know. <clears throat> and in fact, I, I often try to remind people he was the smartest, strongest, greatest person that ever lived on earth. And if you don't think that about him, you'll think that about somebody else, and then you're in real trouble. But each of us has within ourselves manifold sources of life. What comes out in the form of of the character and behavior of the person as a whole is an expression of a few sources in the person that provide, provide the foundation for our life. And now Jesus gives us a list of these and uh, uh, in uh, Mark 12, for example, where he's asked, what's the great commandment? And he doesn't just say it's straighten up and fly right. He talks about the parts of the person. He says, you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Now, I want to invite you this evening to think about this as a list of the elements of the person which Jesus recognized and he understood that each one of these elements has to be dealt with in order to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, and your neighbor as yourself. You can't just do it, for example, by will. And again, one of the killing features of what is presented by so many people as growth in Christ is putting the entire pressure on the will. So now we want to go over these briefly and say what they are. The heart, I think biblically, is the will or the spirit in biblical terms. It is the source of creativity. It's your power to originate. Uh, it is, I like to say, the executive center of the self. It's where you go when you really want to make a difference and get a hold of what's going on in your life. You go to your heart. And Jesus says, you must love God with all your heart. Now, our time is short, so let me just tell you what that means, and we'll try to carry it over to the other elements as well. To love God with all your heart is to have your will set on what is best for Him above everything else. That's how you love God with all your heart. Love is the disposition to bring good into the object that is loved. 
And God has so disposed himself towards his creation and his human creation in particular that we are able to participate in his life by setting our will towards what is good for him. So let's try to say that to love God with all your heart is to have your will and your spirit entirely set on the accomplishment of what is good for God. Now, that's crucial. And we often talk about a surrendered will. We have an old hymn, I surrender all. And that's what it's about. There isn't anything in my life at that point that I would prefer over what is good for God. And what is good for God actually isn't all that hard to figure out. As he's made a point of telling us and our basic sense of what is good and right helps us understand that. And the person who loves God with all their heart is a person whose will is totally devoted to what is good for God. Now, the mind includes both thoughts and feelings, the capacity to represent things. And your will is going to depend on your mind, but interestingly enough, your mind is going to depend upon your will. And uh, this is one of the places where when we have time to go in great depth, we have to talk about how each of these aspects of the person interact with one another. <coughs> what is on your mind sets the scene for your will to choose. On the other hand, what is on your mind is a reflection of where your heart is. To love God with all of your mind is to take your feelings and your thoughts and devote them entirely to what is good for God. That's what it means to love God with all your mind. Your capacity to represent, to believe, to think, and so on is entirely devoted to what is good for God. And because of that, there are just lots of things that will never show up in your mind. And because there are lots of things that will never show up in your mind, there are lots of things you will never think about doing. You won't even think about it. See, one of the things that deeply reveals character is what you have to think about. And if you have to think about whether or not you're going to do things that are wrong, well, there's something wrong with your mind. And you need to work on your mind. And that may be in the area of feelings or it may be in the area of representations. These go together. They don't come separately. What you habitually feel is a major feature of your mind. And it is tied to what you think about. And so we have to look at that area of our lives which goes into our mind and we have to turn that to the love of God. Now, Social context, relations. People are relational beings. That's why the truth of the Trinity is so important for us to understand. Uh, we are relational beings. We, we're not made to live alone, and we can't actually do that. But we have to be careful that our relationships to others are places where the love of God dwells. And here, as with the other dimensions of the self, we have to say that to love God, we must love our neighbor as ourselves. And to do that is to inject what is good for God into all of our relationships. In a fallen world, human relationships are generally dominated by attack and withdrawal. And that's one of the things that we are busy sizing people up about when we come into contact with them is, are they going to attack us? 
and perhaps I had better be careful and withdraw before they have an opportunity to attack. And that makes it impossible to love our neighbors. It makes it impossible for us to come out to them in the presence of God and manifest God's love in our relationship to our neighbors. We don't attack people in the love of God. We don't withdraw from them. We accept them, we love them. And loving our neighbor is a part of what goes into loving God. As John teaches us in his letter, you cannot love God and not love your neighbor. They don't fit together because God actually does love your neighbor. Uh, seems very unlikely to many people as they look at their neighbor, but God does love them, and He loves the neighbor who is your enemy. And so He very naturally says, love your enemies. Now, to love your enemies means to seek what is good for them in dependence on God. And of course, the best thing that could happen to your enemy is that they would come to know God. And our blessing on our enemy is designed to help them to step into the position of knowing the God that we know. To love our neighbor is not necessarily to help them do the bad things they want to do to us. In fact, it isn't that at all. It doesn't mean to help them get their way because very often the worst thing for a human being is to get their way. And so we need to know how to stand in the world under God with our neighbor in an attitude of love. And then our body. Our body is um, our little power pack that God has given us to live with. And it works mainly by habit, and that's a good thing. Uh, habit is a, a wonderful gift of God, and in fact, spiritual disciplines are designed to disrupt bad habits and replace them with good habits. Habit is what you do without thinking. It also relates to what you do after you do something without thinking. <laughs> so the difference between Peter and Judas was what they did after they had done something without thinking or would think, were thinking the wrong thing. And so our body is designed to enable us to live without thinking. And I'll tell you, if you think that's bad, you ought to try to live thinking about everything. <laughs> and you'll be paralyzed. Uh, you don't want to ride in a car with a driver who has to think about what they're doing. Uh, hopefully they're conscious. <laughs> mm, can't always count on that. But you, you want them to be able to act for what is good without having to think about it. And that's true in personal relationships, generally. And we have to grow into good habits and out of bad habits in order to have the proper relationship of love to our neighbor. Our soul is the deepest part of the self. Our soul is the integrative part of the human being. By the way, you aren't your soul, and your soul isn't going to go to heaven by itself. You're going to go to heaven. You don't save souls, you save people. Now, because the soul is the deepest part of the self, you have to reach that part of you, in, uh, of the person, in order to bring wholeness to the individual human being. The soul is the deepest part of you. And uh, it's not something that you have direct access very often to. Occasionally, if you're very quiet, it will show up. And one of the main function of Christian disciplines is to allow your soul to come out of its cover and to be recognized and to be restored. And the restoration of the soul is fundamental to human redemption. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. The law of the Lord is perfect, Psalm 19 says restoring the soul. The law restores the soul by bringing it into harmony with what God is doing. 
And as that happens, then the whole person that has been divided and split up by all of the conflicts that are in its life, in its own will even, the conflicted will is one of the most common features of the lost and fallen human being. But as the soul is restored, you're no longer defeated by the conflicts and the habits of your will. They are focused on God. And sometimes the soul is so broken that it requires special ministry. And indeed we want to understand that all of the dimensions of the self are areas where the ministry of those who are able to act and live in the power of God is vital to restoring. Many people are so lost in destructive human relationships that they don't even know what's happening. And that, of course, is one of the great services of psychiatrists and psychologists especially who understand these kinds of things. But historically, the divided person is the primary area where the psychologist has to come in to try to help put it all back together. And unfortunately, most of them have lost the idea of the soul, and they've lost the idea of the person. And so they're limited in what they can do to actually help. And unless they are Christians or very wise people, they're limited in the resources they have uh, to help people who are divided and split up, and their soul is in trouble. So now let me just say this. The great commandment of Mark 12 lists every dimension under the governance of Jesus' kind of love. And that is what we have to understand and make sure that when we are bringing ourselves into harmony with Jesus, we are learning to do the things that he said. That is a process of bringing all of the parts of the person under his governance, redeeming the mind and redeeming the thoughts and the emotions uh, is a, a major part of that because they play such a role in determining how we choose and how we feel about things and then how we act. See, now... This is where going beyond the righteousness of the scribe and the Pharisee that we talked about earlier becomes so fundamental. Because when we're working with these parts, we are moving beyond the righteousness of the scribe and the Pharisee. And Jesus' insight into this are often expressed by him and they are profound. He often puts it in figures like a good tree cannot bring forth bad fruit. And he also says a bad tree can't bring forth good fruit. And given how we've been shaped by our thinking, we're apt to believe that last part, but not believe the first part. We're apt not to believe that a good tree cannot bring forth bad fruit. And so we won't cultivate the good tree. When that is exactly where the work needs to be done, and when you go back through the history of humanity and you read Plato and you read Kant and you read all of the others, East and West, who have tried to solve the human problem, you see that they all come to this idea. You have to go to the depths of the person before you can begin to understand how the harmony of goodness and godliness can come into life. We need to say... You can't do this except in redemptive community. Now that redemptive community may just be your grandmother. And they often create some of the best redemptive community on earth. It, please God, it would be people close to you. And please God, it would be the churches. It would be the ecclesia that are scattered through the community. And when we go into them, we would be moving into an area of restoration of the soul. 
restoration of personal relationships, restoration of our will, of our mind and our feelings. And that's what would be going on in our services. We might change them some. I'm not a big advocate of starting with uh, changing services and order. I, I think it's better not to start there, but let that follow as you change the message and the reality of redemptive life in the community. It comes in community. It comes in community partly because it does depend upon the ministry of individuals who have been gifted by God with special abilities to discern and to speak to and to change things in the person that simply cannot be handled by their own efforts. Sometimes instruction alone can help. Sometimes bringing them into the practice of things like solitude and silence, service, scripture memorization, and other dis disciplines can do wonders to show them what in the moment is the single most complete discipline, which is worship, adoration of God. Those things can help, but we need the ministry of the body. And that comes through the gifts that Christ has placed in his people. And when we are thinking about how we, if you wish, go to church or we go to fellowship, we want to think in terms of ministering in the power of the gifts that God gives his people and receiving that benefit to ourselves. If we slip back into the righteousness of the scribe and the Pharisee, we'll think about running successful services, whatever that means. And success, the definition of success for the minister is one of the most important things in learning how to live in the easy yoke with Christ. And each one of us needs to think about what do we take as a mark of success for our ministry and our lives. And we need to understand how that always involves the transformation of character. And Jesus, you remember, talks about how some people will come and say, well, you taught in our streets, and we listened to you, and we cast out demons, and we did works in your name. And he will say, no, I don't know you. I don't know where you're from. And he has shifted the picture from the level of action to the level of character. Who are you? And that's the deepest question that we want to have before us as we attempt to minister in the Trinitarian fellowship. Church can be the doorway for radical transformation. And that's what we should expect and hold ourselves to by the grace of God to see coming out of all of our local assemblies and all of our gatherings of disciples. And if we gather as disciples, that's what we will see. It's disciples who go through the process of transformation so that they come out actually loving God with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind, with all their strength, and their neighbor as themselves. And you know what? Easy, routine obedience is what follows. That is the good fruit that comes out of the good tree. And that's where we want to put our emphasis. And uh, that's the last clause in the Great Commission deals with teaching them to do all things whatsoever I have commanded. Unfortunately, many people read that as teaching them they ought to do. But what it's talking about is teaching them in such a way that they routinely do. That they wouldn't think of doing anything else. And as we do that, we begin to see the glory of the easy yoke and the light burden that Christ invites us to.
uh, all of us are so captured by that notion of change and we hunger for change and as you walk through it there's tremendous logic to it and it's very compelling yes. take the person that's been in the church for a long time and maybe even read some of what you have written and tried to make some progress and they find themselves saying I just feel like change is so hard mm -hmm. and I feel like or I look at other people and mm -hmm. I think the reality is people who talk too much have such a hard time not talking too much. Mm -hmm. uh, people that are fearful have such a hard time not being fearful. Right. Why is change so hard? And then what would you say to the person who finds themselves frustrated by that? Well, I would stick with them to begin with uh, because here the, the issue is all a matter of details. The person who talks too much talks too much for a reason. And what you do is you don't try to not talk too much. You try to find out what is the reason why you talk too much. And you change that. And talking too much takes care of itself. And that's the general pattern you want to look for. So in our teaching and leadership and example, we want to be encouraging people to not want what they now want, to not think what they now think, to not feel what they now feel, and to all, uh, just go through the, the range of things. For every person who is concerned about changing uh, a particular kind of thing, there is a reason why they're troubled with that. And this is absolutely vital uh, in the things that get so much attention, like pornography. Where does that come from? See, you can't deal with these things by will. You have to figure out where it comes from. Why do people want to do that? Or talking too much, uh, or so many other things. Uh, not giving. Like you, you often have people say, well, I'd like to give more, but uh, you know, I just can't. Well, why can't you? See? There's a reason. And perhaps you could start by burning your credit cards. <laughs> and uh, the credit cards are one of the greatest threats to practical wisdom that has ever hit the earth. It's very serious, this issue of credit. Um, what it enables you to do and then able to get back of that why do you need to do that so in in general John I'm sorry I'm running on about this because this is tremendously important if you want to change find out where your action comes from will you actually use that language and say you need to want you need to not want what you want and not think what you now think right. and Yes, and so that then, is a different aim right, than and just start doing the right stuff. Right, and now if you're not willing to not want what you now want, you're stuck. That's where the will comes in. If you're willing to not want what you now want, then you begin to find out, well, why do you want what you want? And that requires fellowship. This is the kind of work we could be doing in our fellowships, in our uh, small groups and all of this. Uh, I encourage uh, groups to have a, to run a six-week seminar on anger and invite eight people who are ready to get out of anger. And you could do it with lust, you can do it with anything. But get serious about education. Have you done that in groups with people? I have done it with uh, a group of three uh, and have observed the change that comes well, simply from looking at um, where their behavior comes from. Now, you don't need to be very explicit about all this. You need to do it. And in, in general, in our churches and fellowship groups, we need to be very careful about announcing revolutions. And we need to just begin preaching the gospel, encouraging people to come together mm -hmm. and uh, work on the things that they want to change. How, how much would you say someone should expect to change? How much change 
are, are we, with God's help, capable of? Well, you're capable of uh, walking in all of the things that Jesus said to do. There isn't anything that you can't do by the grace of God if you're willing to go through the process of finding the roots of the behavior and changing the roots. If you're stuck on changing the behavior, you kill yourself and everyone else will hate you. You know, because you'll be a miserable person. And you'll fail. And they'll say, aha. Uh -huh. You know. But all of the things that Jesus taught, we can learn if we will go to the roots of behavior. And now eventually that's going to be finding in those areas of spirit, mind, soul, where the sources of the behavior come from. And of course, it isn't just all negative. I mean, I, I wish I'd had time to talk about positive things like uh, the great Psalm 119. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my... And by the way, we're talking about knowledge here. See, we're talking about learning what is the truth and living in that. And when we do that positively, then we're back to Psalm 1 man. Psalm 1 man is someone whose roots have gone down into the richness of the kingdom of God. And now because of that, he brings forth his fruit. The tree brings forth its fruit in its season. And the mark of the disciplined person is they do what needs to be done when it needs to be done. I could probably take a score to Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata and pick out every note on that score but I couldn't pick them out when they need to be picked out. <laughs> and that's true in sports, um, tennis, basketball, whatever. The Lakers lost many series to the Celtics because <laughs> a guy named Russell knew that if he could stay within five points of the Lakers, he could beat them. Because when he came down to the end, they would not be able to do what they needed to do when it needed to be done. And it's the mark of the disciplined person that they are able to do that. And often that means turning off what you're hearing and listening to another voice. But we learn how to do that always by looking at the details. What would you say if someone is just discouraged? For the person that's here tonight, they're just ready to give up because they feel like change will never happen. Well, if I, I, I would, first of all, I would want to sit with them and listen to them and help them understand why they're saying what they're saying. And I believe my experience is that you don't have to go very far with that until people begin to see a light. Hmm. Hmm. But you, you have to listen to people and we don't do enough listening. We, we think too highly of talking at people. Uh, and we need to listen more. And as we listen, we begin to perceive the roots of their behavior and find out why they are so discouraged. And then there's the occasion to teach in that context. And uh, to teach not just by laying the truth out on them, but saying, now, why don't you try this? See, my vision of... Um, of uh, spiritual direction, which is not an educated one, just one that comes out of my experience, is the main thing that the spiritual director does is help people find ways of responding that will bring them in touch with what is the saving grace of God where they are. So you suggest things for them to do and then you come back and talk with them about that. And that's how learning actually goes. And it's been my privilege to watch this in the lives of so many people, and often ministers. Uh, they are put in touch with the reality that delivers them. But it pulls them, it gives them hope. Hmm. And the hopelessness comes out of just trying what is hopeless 
over and over and over again. See, that's, as a young Baptist minister, um, I became conscious that the best people in my congregation were the ones who felt most guilty and would come and rededicate themselves if I put a little pressure on them. And you know, as a Baptist, you can't get saved again, but you can rededicate yourself an endless number of times. <laughs> And they felt better if they did that, but they didn't solve the problem. Yeah. And I, that's, this is one of the things, um, sorry to inject so much of myself into it, this is one of the things that really turned around my idea of how you minister to people. Because I realized I was not saying, saying anything that was helping these people. And uh, so, I, and that really meant I wasn't actually helping them get into the things that were defeating them. Mm -hmm. So that's the key, I think, uh, in all of these matters, is you, you, you listen to people, you try to discern, of course, this is a spiritual work, not just clever, uh, but it involves intelligence and application. Uh, you listen to them and you help them see why they're failing. It brings up a question, Dallas, that got texted in, and I've heard this kind of thing before. When you talk about spiritual discipline, sometimes people will ask, it sounds like a purely human activity. You find out that somebody wrestles with gossip, and so if they practice silence, then that might help them not to have to gossip so much. But it's not clear or they'll ask, where is the spirit in that? Where is God in that? Isn't that just human activity? Well, it certainly is a human activity. And uh, everything that goes into the religious life is a human activity. Going to church is a human activity. The thing is, all of the human activities are designed to meet the grace of God. And the practice of silence can help you realize that you don't stop breathing when you stop talking. <laughs> Pause you for just one second. You said all, when you say all human activities are designed to meet the grace of God, do you mean all spiritual disciplines or just human activity generally? All human activity generally, but then when you come to spiritual disciplines, you have a special case with special needs that are being addressed. But they're all designed to engage the grace of God. And we're built for that. That's what our creation was about, and that's what our work life is, and our family life is activity uh, that meets the grace of God. Um, talk to us a little bit more about the soul. There's so much mystery around that one, and you talked tonight about how sometimes if we're real quiet, the soul will come out. Yes. How do you know when the soul has come out? What if the soul comes out and I miss it? Uh, well, if I think that that's a good statement because uh, I think you're probably certainly going to miss it uh, if you approach it in an attitude of anxiety. And that's why the disciplines t standardly give us indirection. Uh, that is to say, it doesn't try to find the soul but it practices something that allows the soul to make itself known. And the soul is experienced as a kind of inner force. I like to compare it to an inner river uh, that pulls everything in our world together and makes our experiences one life. And when the soul isn't functional, then our experiences are shattered conflicting, uh, set against one another, and uh, we use the word integrity. We don't have integrity. The soul integrates, and uh, it's like, how do you know when your mind is showing up? Well, by experience, you, you uh, now I'm thinking, now I'm feeling, now I'm choosing. And all of these dimensions of the self are learned by experience. But for the soul, we need people who can speak to us with some degree of experience and intelligence about it. And we learn to wait on the soul and on God to come with the soul. And one of the things that happens actually 
in solitude and silence is you discover you have a soul. And for many people, that's a big deal. They're not, they don't know they got one. Uh, and their life isn't based upon a sense of unity. Jesus asked that provocative question, which in English is translated, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What does it mean for your soul to be lost? It means that your life doesn't have a center that organizes your activities. And it can't have that center until it returns to God and God restores the soul. People can help. I know that some of you have a ministry which is basically a soul ministry. And a lot of what goes under the name of inner healing prayer is soul work. And it, it uh, nearly always involves waiting for the Lord to make a context in which we can begin to be honest with what's in our soul. That's not a very satisfactory answer, but that's about the best I could do with that. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> did, did you, how did you come aware of the fact that you have a soul? How did that happen for you? Well, I basically through the realization that I was not a whole person. And that the reason I was not a whole person was because there was not an organizing principle that was drawing everything together and making me a whole person. And then I began to experience something of God's work in that direction in my life through some confession and some ministry um, uh, by people who knew what they were doing with this. And uh, I began to discover there was a dimension to myself that I had not suspected. And uh, Jane was a part of this, and uh, some of our experiences after we were first married with ministers who worked with people who were in desperate need of soul restoration. So it's a, it is a path of experience. You become aware of it. You become aware of yourself as being a part of a larger world. And confession actually is very important to discovering your soul. And it's one of the disciplines that uh, really can be revolutionary because it goes so deep into the unity of the person. You see, when, essentially, when you confess, you give up splitting the self. You stop Wait, running... Say that again, when you confess. When you confess, you give up splitting the self. So when you sin... You own up to what you are. When you sin, are you always splitting yourself? Sin always splits the self in some degree, yes. Because you know that you have harmed yourself and others, but you probably are not going to come to terms with that because you're carrying on a charade of righteousness, even if you don't believe it. Um, so confession is very deep in the process of discovering the soul. Is that part of why I know you've talked about a lot of times when churches experience the Spirit heavily, when there's revival, confession will be one of the first signs of it? It's nearly, it's nearly inconceivable to me that you can have genuine revival without confession. Because that's the breaking of the hindrances and uh, the saving of face <laughs> that goes into the charade of ordinary living. Uh, is what has to be um, left to fall on the floor. Why is it it seems like people confess at AA meetings so readily and that churches not much at all or not deeply? Well, AA got its stuff from the church. And it, it's very sad because AA had to be invented 
uh, to help people, many of whom were in the church, who could not be honest about what they were living through. And so uh, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous uh, drew from the sources of Christian teaching about these things. And, I mean, you can imagine the difference that it would make if we began our churches, our church services or our meetings together by saying, Hi, I'm Dallas. I'm a recovering sinner. Can you imagine we started there? Uh, but so much of our services are devoted to a kind of pretending everything is fine. We may have a little place where we confess our sins, and receive absolution or something like that. But it doesn't go into the depth of our fellowship. And, uh, and then, of course, AA isn't just the meetings. It's what goes into the relationships that come out of those meetings, the commitment of people to how they live with one another. Uh, AA is one of the most brilliant illustrations of discipline and what it does on earth.